Uh, Greg and I have known each other for over 10 years. He is the founder of Homeboy Industries, which is the largest gang rehabilitation and reentry program in the world. And for over 30 years, Homeboy has been a beacon of hope in LA to provide training and support to formerly gang involved and previously incarcerated people, allowing them to redirect their lives and become contributing members of our community. So tonight we welcome Father Greg, Homeboy's founder, and Brandon and Saul, two members of the Homeboy community. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Brandon Washington. Hello, my name is Brian Washington and I'm part of Homeboy's Industries. And the um, reason why I'm in Homeboy's Industries is because uh, I'm a gang affiliated and um, I've been through so much and I was busted for years and years, the only way and, and programs I found was Father G's Homeboy's Industries. And um, I'm on my way to get my GED and stuff like that so I can be a vet technician. So I'm trying to be good. And I love animals, so that's my, my um, only way instead of mine that would relax me instead of going out there and find trouble and trying to just murder somebody and just, you know, so I'm trying to, animals will help me out, a way for me to calm myself down and, you know, they understand so they know how they feel and thank Father G and my friend right here. So thank you. Well, that was not very long. It worked. For real? Yeah. Well, um, my name's Saul and I'm employed at Homeboys too. And to be honest, like, most of my life, like, I ain't really care about anything. Like, like me, myself, as a person, really didn't, uh, like, cared about uh, my mom, brothers, sister, anything. And Father G, he helped me out, you know. He gave me my first job. He actually, uh, I felt like the job he gave me was, like, so easy that it wasn't even a job. It was, like, cleaning helping out and I couldn't commit to something. So being so easy of a job, I couldn't even go because I was too lazy. Like my, my, my way of being was like, if I could do something fast and get money and like basically take my day and basically get a little meal, eat, I would have been straight. I wouldn't really mind, but what happened? Um, I happened to go to jail. I ain't really care in jail anyways, like about nothing too. Until I noticed I was gonna get out. Like I was gonna go home and all those years in prison and juvenile hall didn't really mean nothing if I come back again. So once again, I went to homeboys and he employed me. And I feel like this time, I really understand what like homeboy does for us. They're a place that like, like even though you don't really have much and you're struggling yourself, they'll help you out and they'll like basically, um, like if you really like going through something, they wouldn't be like uh, any other job and be like, you know what? Like if you can't do the job, then can you leave? Cause we need somebody willing to work. They're more like willing to help you out while you, you're at the job and it actually helps you out. Like it takes more pressure away from you and your family and whatever necessities you got to do. And now that I'm here, uh, to be honest, I ain't never spoke to nobody like in a crowd. It's the first time. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, it feels it feels like 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 nerve wracking, but <laughs> you just gotta do it. You know, you just gotta do it. And one thing I know that in life you gotta push yourself. You gotta uh, move your feet one at a time to get somewhere. So if you don't move your feet to do what you want in life, like education. Whatever the case must be, uh, trade. Like, I might still be working on my Jeezy, too. Um, 
Um, I was just telling you the other day, I never read a book until I went to prison. My first book was Wizard of Oz. For real. <laughs> it was so easy that when I was reading it, I was actually seeing the movie. Like in my head, like, like you know, easy words, easy sentences, little brick wall, whatever. <laughs> you know? And, and, and after that, I noticed that, that, like, that was a way of, like, escaping a cell. Like if, if I'm in this room for like 23 hours, 22 hours, I could easily pick up a book, which I like fiction, and go and fly and like basically, um, you know, basically be part of the story. And then I decided one day to take my, uh, my, my GD. And all my life I felt dumb. Like uh, when you're used to being told that you ain't really worth nothing, you grow up thinking that you ain't nothing. Like, it's just, it's just that's, that's how the mind works. Like, you know, so in general, I never felt smart enough to pass a test. And one day I just took it. I passed the, uh, the reading, science, and I'm not even a scientist. And, <laughs> and history, which I don't even know about history. I, I just basically read what I read and look back and find the answers. So now, like, I'm trying to pass math. That's, that's, that's something you really got to know what you're doing. For real. For real. Hey, man, it's hard. Once, once, it, once it comes to, like, uh, Y's and Z's, and I be like, man, I feel like I'm, I'm learning my ABCs, basically. But what I really want to say is, I'm right here, uh, I thank Father G. Uh, he has changed my life. You know, uh, I, I met G through a juvenile hall. I used to just go to church just to get on my bunk. Like, you know, instead of being sitting on my bunk, I go to church and he'll be preaching, talking about everything he talks about, telling, telling us about homeboys. And basically like, like, I would just go and I really, really pay attention. It was more of like, man, I'm outside this little room or this little uh, whatever I'm at. So as long as I could walk over there and see other people and talk, I don't really mind. Till so one day I got out when I was in juvenile hall and he gave me a job. And that's how I know about G. And, and that's not even my only time I ran into him in jail. I ran into him every time I went to jail. So he was consistent, for real, he was consistent, yeah. Like, you would think like somebody will go and be like, say something and he's consistent for like two years and then next time you go, they're like, oh yeah, he, he just stopped coming out of nowhere, you know, but he stood. And now I'm here, you know, uh, getting my second chance, trying to make a living and trying to find uh, what makes me happy and what I could do to, to basically be happy and away from jail. And well, that's it. Yeah. 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 One, I didn't say um, the <laughs> loud ass homies behind me. Um, so it, a great privilege uh, to travel with these two fellows. They'd never been on the plane. Well, uh, Brandon hadn't, and and uh, Saul had, uh, but barely can remember it. So it was great to see the two of them panicked in the sky yesterday as we <laughs> flew. So uh, hello to Loretta Holstein, who maybe is watching. We love you, Loretta, and thank you for you and Bob for starting this amazing journey many years ago. Uh, so just to kind of give you the lay of the land, um, 
they were, were to speak for seven minutes each, and then I was going to yak very briefly because I'm going to talk tomorrow, and then we we're going to, um, and then we we're going to um, engage in question and answer. So, um, and I hope that you will have some questions, especially for these two fellows, so they can speak longer than they did. <laughs> so um, it's the privilege of my life for all these 34, 37 years to, um, to uh, know people like uh, Saul and Brandon and uh, many thousands like them uh, over all these uh, decades. Uh, people like Hector, there was a, a homie named Hector who uh, who was like 16 years old and uh, he came into my office. I was looking at something on my desk and I looked up and I, I couldn't, uh, I went, whoa, his whole face was rearranged. And uh, I presume that he had gotten into some fight with, uh, you know, some rivals. And I said, oh my God, what happened to you? And it's like, he didn't even know what I was talking about. Then he said, oh, this, <laughs> yeah, well, my bike, was teaching me how to fly. And the poet Jack Gilbert says, uh, the pregnant heart is driven by hopes that are the wrong size for this world. So we all cherish and, and nurture hopes that are the wrong size for this world, which is what these days together are. And it is about hope, as Brian was calling all of you, uh, you are examples of hope. And the poet writes, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul that sings the song without the words and never stops at all. And so it's about singing the song without the words and never stopping. And so the hope is that we will announce a message to the world. Um, maybe things could look differently. At Homeboy, we talk about uh, hope has an address. And uh, so, um, and we were always kind of a, a, a place of hope and a place of uh, connection. And even going back to uh, the time uh, when I was pastor of Dolores Mission, the poorest parish in the uh, city uh, archdiocese of Los Angeles nestled in the middle of two public housing projects. We had eight gangs at war with each other. And um, I buried my first young person uh, killed because of this sadness in 1988. And I buried my 253rd last week, a young man named Isaiah. Not all of them from that community, of course, uh, but now uh, homeboy is quite large and uh, I get asked to do this and I know a lot of gang members. So the first thing we did was we started a school and then we started a jobs program and then we started uh, uh, social enterprises. And uh, Homeboy Bakery was the very first place that we started. And that was in 1992. After the unrest in Los Angeles, after the Rodney King uh, verdict was passed down, uh, the whole city exploded. And uh, every pocket of poverty ignited except the poorest pocket, Dolores Mission. And uh, so the LA Times came to me and uh, wanted to know why I thought that this didn't happen there. And uh, and I said, I don't know, well, maybe it's because we had 60 strategically hired rival gang members who had a reason to get up in the morning and a reason not to gangbang the night before, and, uh, and a reason not to torch their own community. So this article appeared in the LA Times, and um, a movie producer named Ray Stark read this article, and... Um, he happened to have $500 million, you know, and, and so he summoned me to his office and he said, how should I spend my money? And, and I can see now that I 
greatly undershot my request, but um, he, um, I said, well, well, there's an abandoned bakery across the street from the church and you could buy it, it you know, and uh, it has ovens, they don't work, but you could fix them. And uh, I don't know, we could call it uh, Homeboy Bakery and rival gang members can wear hairnets and work side by side with each other. So he said, yes. And so we were off and running. This was in 1992, and, and this was kind of the wrong size for the world because people wanted to demonize the gang member. Uh, in those early days, you know, the first 10 years uh, of Homeboy, uh, we had death threats, bomb threats, hate mail, uh, and, uh, and not from gang members, but from folks who had thoroughly uh, demonized gang members. Uh, in fact, we had a, a young girl named Lisa who was right out of a probation camp and she grew up in the projects and she was answering, you know, um, the phone and she said, Homeboy Industries, how may I help you? And she said, bring that bomb over here, motherfucker. That's right, yes. I'm 1848 East First Street. And I'm saying, I'm sorry, Lisa, what is that? You know, and, and oh, it's some fool who wants to blow the place up and... I said, we'll say God bless you and have a nice day. You know, it's, she's giving the Mad Bomber map quest, you know. And, uh, so, but in those early days, so that was hard to retrieve those uh, images of hostility towards homeboy industries because uh, we stood with gang members. And so people from all over the world came to see Homeboy Bakery. You know, it was... Uh, uh, you know, TV crews and um, busloads of Japanese tourists, you know, take me to your bakery. And, uh, and um, even Prince Charles and his business advisors uh, came to see the place. And so uh, in those early days, you know, uh, we had uh, our foreman was a man named Roman. And Roman um, had been the, the, like the biggest drug dealer uh, in our uh, you know, in the projects, and I knew all of them, and he was the most lucrative. And uh, he just always resisted any invitation to uh, to work at Homeboy until uh, he didn't. And in recovery, we always uh, talk about, you know, it takes what it takes. It, uh, you know, a long stretch in prison, the birth of a son, the death of a friend. I suspect uh, for Roman, it was the... Uh, the birth of his daughter, Clarissa. And so he finally, you know, uh, put away his uh, day job and, and night job and, and became a, a baker at, home, at Homeboy Bakery. And so he was a, a leader in his gang, so it was natural as he became a leader uh, as the supervisor of the bakery. And... Um, you know, he, he not only did he work with his enemies, he had to supervise them, which is a great deal more difficult. And uh, so, but he also had to greet the people who were endless stream of uh, news people and tour groups that came in and he hated that part of the job. And he and I once were waiting um, in the uh, bakery parking lot for this odd group of uh, central Californian uh, farm owners who wanted to see the famous Homeboy Bakery. So he's having a bad attitude day and we're, we're standing out in the parking lot and, and uh, he doesn't want to give this tour. And I said, well, get over it. And, and the bus comes in. I said, oh, hi, you know, do you want to park over there? And, uh, and as it's parking, it's one of those slick, sleek, ultra-modern buses that have the microphone at the front, and you know, for the tour guide. And, and Roman is pretending that he's the tour guide, you know. Welcome to Homeboy Bakery. Observe gang members in their natural habitat. Please keep your hands in the bus at all times. Do not attempt to feed the homies. They are not yet tame. You know, I'm saying, Cállate, cabrón. And, and oh, hi, how are you? And welcome. And so uh, I leave and, and uh, Roman gives the tour. So later on, I, I see him and I say, uh, hey, uh, how did that tour go? And he goes, damn, gee, what's up with white people anyway? I, I said, I don't know, you know, what is up with us? And uh, 
I said, well, you know, they always be using the word great. I said, really? He goes, yeah, check this out. This busload of gavachos, white people, they come in and they see the bakery and everything is clean and everything's operational. And, and wow, this place is great. And then they see the homies working side by side with each other. You fellas are great. And then they try the bread and they go, wow, this bread, it's great. He goes, how come white people always be using the word great? I, I said, I don't know. This is the first I've ever heard of this. And trust me, from that moment forward, every opportunity I could find, I told him how great he was, you know, just to, <laughs> just to mess with them. And well, cut to about like three months later, I, I went there at closing time, which was around 11 o'clock at night. And Roman rushes me at my car and he goes, you're not, you're not going to believe what happened yesterday. So he tells me that he goes to pick up his four-year-old daughter, Clarissa, at the babysitter's after his shift. And he drives home to his humble little apartment where for the first time in his life, he's paying rent with honestly earned, clean, decent money. And he unlocks the front door and she just goes running down this little tiny hallway and she lands in the sala and she plants her feet and she takes the whole room in with her gaze and she says, this is great. <laughs> and he said, uh, I thought she was turning white on me. And, and he gets down at eye level and he says, Mika, what's great? And little Carissa, she clutches her chest and she says, my home. And as soon as he says those two words, immediately our eyes well up with tears. And we stare at each other for what feels like an eternity. And I finally break the silence. I say, you did this. You never had a home in your life, and now you got one. You did this. You used to be the biggest drug dealer in town, and you stopped and you baked bread instead. You did this. You've never had a father in your life. And now you are one. And I hate to have to tell you, but you're great. <laughs> and I hate to have to tell you but the first time I ever retrieved that story from my memory bank was to tell it at a Roman's funeral. And he had been uh, preparing his, the trunk of his car, packing for a camping trip he was gonna take. And two guys came into the part of the projects where he lived and their faces were covered. And they saw him and they must have thought he'll do. And, and walked up and executed him. But I told that story because of the questions I kept getting from his homies and his friends that spanned the course of that week from his death uh, to his funeral. And they kept asking, what's the point of doing good if that can happen to you? And it's a good question and it's worthy of an answer. And so I told that packed a church that here was the point that before he left us, he came to know the truth of who he was, that he was exactly what God had in mind when God made him. And so he became that truth. He inhabited that truth and no bullet can pierce it no four prison walls can keep it out and death can't touch it because it's huge. But we all have to uh, reach in and dismantle the messages of shame and disgrace that keep people from seeing their truth. You don't save the day, you don't fix people, you don't rescue folks at the margins. You hold up the mirror and everybody is returned to themselves in the process. Everybody assumes their own dignity and nobility. As the Buddhists say, oh, nobly born, 
remember who you really are. And so with exquisite mutuality, we go to the margins and uh, we try to uh, inhabit our truth and our nobility and our dignity as people. The Christmas carol goes like this, long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. And yet it's a story about Jesus and yeah, it's a story about Christmas, but how is it not the job description of every one of you here this weekend? You appear and the soul feels its worth, exactly right. And to appear in such a way and to embrace an exquisite mutuality where there is no us and them, just us, where you go to the margins not to make a difference, but to allow folks there to make you different, is the wrong size for this world. That's what it looks like to sing the song without the words and to never stop at all. Let me just tell one more story and then I'm gonna open it up to you guys. And apparently there's a microphone there in the middle of the floor. Though we're a small enough group that you can probably holler out your questions, but. Uh, a number of years ago, um, I, uh, a number of years ago, I was, uh, would ride my bike in the middle of the night uh, patrolling the eight uh, gangs uh, in the projects. And um, so I'd have this big black beach cruiser when I was pastor and I would ride around and I would uh, this one night it was in Aliso Village and I was kind of uh, just kicking it with um, these eight guys in a darkened archway in the projects. And, uh, and then I looked over to the side, I could see in the parking lot, there was a homie uh, we all called Bandit who had run up to a car and he was selling crack cocaine, which is uh, what they did then. And then he walked back to the darkness where he didn't know I had arrived and he was counting his money. And I wish I could say that he was uh, embarrassed, but he wasn't so much. And uh, he never stepped foot in Homeboy Industries until he did. And, and, and he was tired of being tired, as he said that day when he came to Homeboy. And so he... Uh, started to do the work and he started to excavate his wound and he started to decide to transform his pain so he didn't have to transmit it anymore. And he went to therapy and he got tattoos removed and he went to anger management class and he came to terms with what had been done to him as a child and what he had done as well. And then the time came for him to move on and he, uh, we try to keep the transition seamless. So between our 18 month training program, which these guys are in, um, then they move on and get a job uh, located for them by somebody in our workforce development office. And he was sent uh, uh, to his next destination, more resilient than when he had arrived. And now the world was going to throw at him what it will, but this time he wouldn't be toppled. And so he goes to some kind of warehouse job, a first kind of job, entry level job. And he works there and he's like there five years and then he becomes the mero chingon of the whole place. He's running the floor and then he's um, three years after that, he becomes even more elevated and gets married to his childhood sweetheart and uh, has three daughters and he buys a home. And no news is good news, and I hadn't heard from him in a long time with uh, gang members, it's good news. And he calls me on a Friday afternoon with a little bit of panic in his voice. And, uh, and he says, gee, you gotta bless my daughter. I said, que paso, mijo? Is she sick or is she in the hospital? And he said, oh no, no, on, on Sunday, she's going to Humboldt College. Imagine my my oldest, my Jessica, she's going to college. And, uh, but she, 
she's a little chaparita and we're afraid for her. And she's, you know, uh, Humboldt's far, it's way up north. Do you think you could give her a blessing before she goes? I said, oh my gosh, of course. Uh, look, tomorrow, Saturday, I have baptisms at 1. Uh, why don't you come at 1230? We'll do a little send-off. And uh, sure enough, they all show up at 1230, Bandit and his wife and the three girls, including uh, tiny little Jessica. And we stand in front of the altar, and I kind of uh, say, well, let's put her in the middle, and let's make a circle. Uh, and everybody touch her, you know, put your hands on her shoulder, grab her arm, or go ahead, put your hands on her head. And I tell everybody to bow their heads and to close their eyes. And as the homies say, I do a long ass prayer. You know, I go on and on. And somewhere in the middle of this prayer, I notice that we've all become chiones and, and we're all crying. And I don't know why exactly we're crying, except for the fact that Bandit and his wife don't know anybody who's ever gone to college except me, certainly nobody in their families. And so, you know, we kind of wipe our tears and we, you know, we laugh about how mushy we got. And then to kind of change the subject, I look at Jessica, hey, what are you going to study at Humboldt College? And she was very quick, forensic psychology. And I go, damn, forensic psychology. And, and uh, Bandit says, yeah. She wants to study the criminal mind. And Jessica looks at her dad and does one of these, you know, and, and he laughs and he says, yeah, I'm going to be her first subject. So we go out to the car and uh, big abrazos, everybody piles in the car, but Bandit hangs back and I'm glad he has. And I said, hey, te digo una cosa. I give you credit for the man you've chosen to become for choosing to walk in your own footsteps. I'm proud of you. And his eyes fill up with tears. And he says, Sabes que? I'm proud of myself. All my life, people called me a low life, a bueno para nada, a good for nothing. I guess I showed him. I said, yeah, I guess you did. And the soul feels its worth. Exactly right. Exactly what God had in mind when God made him. Oh, nobly born. Remember who you really are. The pregnant heart is driven by hopes that are the wrong size for this world. And good for you for cherishing the same hopes. And that's what it looks like when you sing the song without the words. So I'd like to invite uh, you to ask uh, questions especially of these two because they uh, shortchanged you in terms of time. And, uh, and so I don't know. I don't think you have to come with them. Yeah, go like that. That's what I think. Yeah, just yell it out and I'll, I'll direct it. Um, I have a lot of respect for you guys for sharing your stories and I really appreciate it. I know getting anxious talking about in front of people is not fun, but I was just wondering, how do you find the will to keep the fight going when it, on days when it's really hard? Um, because obviously you've accomplished so much. I'm just wondering what power is that? To, to be honest, uh, what keeps me going is uh, my freedom. Uh, I never really cared about my freedom in my life till I did like nine years straight in prison. 
Damn. One thing I one thing that keeps me going now is knowing that when you're not when you're not close to your family, when when they don't know you, they only know you through a a, a envelope letter through a phone. And then when you get out, they don't even know you. They don't even like like the little kids don't really talk to you. And that's what keeps me going. I want to be part of their life. And I don't want to be that guy. The guy that that doesn't really care about them. More like that that uncle that that they know and that they can be proud of. That's what keeps me going. What keeps me going is, I mean, I have a daughter and I always get busted and she would always say, where's daddy and stuff like that. So, I mean, only letters, pictures, like homeboy said, mails, anything. And um, now since I'm out, I'm blessing, it's a blessing. And Father G is the greatest person in the world for having me out here and having a speech that way I can make myself feel better. And that way I don't feel like I'm nobody, you know, or a little life like that. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I really enjoyed what you had to say about um, holding up the mirror to help people who are on the mar margins because sometimes it's easy to get this mindset that you're saving people, but you kind of, that was a really insightful idea or metaphor of helping people see who they really are. And I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more on like how you do that practically, personally, and as an organization, as someone in the future who wants to work with marginalized communities, like how can we practically do that work? Thank you. So, I mean, part of what uh, the tenet at Homeboy is uh, relational wholeness. So if, if it's true that uh, traumatized people are probably more kind of inclined to cause trauma, as they would say, then it's equally true that a cherished person is going to be able to find their way to the joy there is in cherishing themselves and others. So it's all relational wholeness. It's all, we call it therapeutic mysticism at Homeboy, where, where we... Um, you just answer. It's the relationship that saves and heals. So it's not like you know my words of wisdom or or even somebody's action. It's if you can enter into relationship where people at, at feel seen. You know, homies will say there we're used to being watched, but we're not used to being seen. And so um, that's the essence of. That's sort of the essence of to sing the song without the words. We're so, we're so reliant on words. We think it's about words where we want to win the argument or we want to convince people of something. Or we want them to you know, move beyond the mind they have, but we're going to try to get them there through words. But it's really about something else. It's about showing up and there, there's a program. I know a lot of the high schools have Kairos, but, but in prisons, um, they have a kind of a mantra um, and, and they, they tell this to the volunteers before they go into the prisons because they're nervous about being volunteers and part of the Kairos program where they think, what, what should we say? And so their mantra is a simple one. Listen, listen, love, love. And, and that's pretty good in terms of how we should be at the margins as we welcome people and as we delight in people and as we allow them to alter our hearts. So it's, it's kind of a stance. It's, it's not, uh, you know, taking the right stand on issues. It's about standing in the right place and standing in the right way. All right, 
Um, how old were you two when you joined your gangs and why did you join? So I was 12 years old when I joined, joined my gang and um, where I stay at, it's a small city. So I mean, we have enemies throughout the blocks, at blocks after blocks after blocks. So I mean, it was just small. We were just, where well, it's ghetto. So I mean, we just decided to just join the gang and just trying to get money or, you know, or just go out and rob people and stuff like that. And yeah, I was 12 years old. And just doing time behind bars is, I mean, and it, like you said, ain't nothing, you know. And what hurts me is just my daughter, you know, pictures, how old is she and stuff like that. Oh, uh, I really never felt like I joined a gang. It was more like, like just embrace my family. Like for example, uh, when I was growing up, my dad, he, he wasn't around and my mom, she was working like basically like a savage or a slave. Like just just to pay bills and, and they gave us enough time to to go to the streets and like play soccer, basketball, anything we wanted to. And, and that's how it was when we were young. But then like we started getting old. I remember it was like fourth grade or fifth grade. When we knew, oh, you know what? It was fifth grade. We were gonna go to uh, what is it? What is it? Middle school, and that's when everybody started picking sides. Like, like in a way of picking sides means like everybody else started like separating into groups. Like where you live defines who you are in general. So, like other people started like getting other gangs and and it wasn't even like getting in because of getting in. It was more like just embracing who they was and just do the usual thing. But I became a gang member when, uh, I remember one day they called me outside just to like hang out, but I didn't know I was gonna get jumped in. And I came outside just like not thinking much. And I still remember this, like my friend was taking out his earrings and his his jewelry, and I didn't even realize what was going on until till they just jumped me. And at first I felt like betrayed, but it wasn't even more betrayed. It was more like, like, why don't you guys tell me? But they were all like, man, you know, you always been from the hood. And I was like, you're not lying. So that's what happened. Uh, ever since then, like, like I couldn't go places I want to no more. It was more like just stay in my block, on my whole little border or whatever, and just dedicate myself to like try to make some type of money. That's about it. Oops, my bad. Uh, and this is a question for both of you as well. What influenced you to join or to go to Homeboy Industries? The reason why I went to Homeboy Industries is to better up, better myself, and um, that way I can have a better life, and I wouldn't be out there in the streets causing trouble, trying to get busted just, just to go to jail, just to see the homies, or, you know, and um, it's a good program. I finished halfway done through an 18 month program and they helped me, helped me with clothes, shoes, anything, because I was homeless. And now I'm back on my feet and thank God and Father G that I'm here and alive because I couldn't have been in the grave. So, yeah. What inspired me to go to Homeboys was Basically, like his commitment or help. Like, like I've been hired three times from him, basically, and I really never took it serious till, till like I started noticing he does help. If you need help, he'll help you. But sometimes, like they say, like you could take a horse to the water, but you can't make him drink water. 
So he, he would employ me, but I wouldn't really uh like take it serious towards this last time around. And that's what basically uh helped me out the most, like from having nothing to having something if it was good. So that's inspirational. For real. How about one last one last question? Um, I was gonna say that like people have been generally discouraged because of the pandemic, but at our college we try to bring advocacy to students to kind of show them their worth. But many college students today can't even take a compliment and kind of shut down instead of feeling worthy or like that they could accept love. So my question is for the three of you: like, how do you all accept love? And how do you think we can learn to embrace our value better? You know what? Well, that's that's very interesting because I was just telling them about that. That like like I'm not used to somebody giving me anything. Like life doesn't work like that. Like somebody just don't give you anything. Like in general, if your car breaks down, nobody cares. If you got money saved up, then you got it. You know, but like the type of love that, that we get from homeboys, like what they what they provide for us is like like mind blowing. And I still I still feel like it ain't real, but but like it has paid off, man, trying to just do better. Yeah. It's still hard to take love. Like for not being in love forever and do not feel love, and it's confusing. So, I mean, I don't, I don't feel loved. I mean, I never felt love because I was never around my family, never around my mom, and um, the only person that did I love and seen the picture was my daughter and. That just heartbroke me, and I went through programs, programs, so I can help myself out. And I mean, when I went walked into those doors of Homeboys Industries, it just inspired me. Like, wow, I, mean, I don't know, I could, I could do this, you know. And so out there, just acting like a fool, going to jail, and doing this and that. And now I just little by little, I feel kind of little love, but I mean, it's hard for love. It's hard. Yeah, I think that the um, the essence of ministry is being able to receive people. And, and I had a homie in Houston who was working with gang members in the streets of Houston. And after a talk, he came up to me and he said, uh, how do you reach them? Meaning gang members. And I found myself saying, well, you know, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? And it's, a, it's part of our practice, I think, is to enter fully into relationship with people because it's what Jesus did. And it's part of our practice to allow your hearts to be changed. And it's part of our practice to receive people and uh, allow yourself to be reached. So it's a decision you make and you choose it every day with every breath that you take. Thank you all very much.